mine. I got it bad for you. You give me good love. You like a dream come true. They say you won't lie. They say you're wild and free. I know you never were a one man woman. I was hoping you would give the all up for me. Happy Tuesday, everybody? Yeah, wait, what? what? My God. Bryce, that was a banger. I like that one. What yeah. was that? This is uh, the new song Suspicious from Follower and Bridges, out now on Monster Cat. Hells yeah. Dad. I love it. Man, normally we do a bunch of banter and stuff, but man, are we under the gun? You guys just want to dive in? How close are we, Bryce? Get in. I, weird. I'm good to go, actually. We can start uh, if uh, you gentlemen are ready. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Take it away. All right. Back. Ready? In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Adrian Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, everybody from sunny Florida. Mm. Brian Brushwood. Reporting for duty right here at Diamond Club Studios, deep in the heart of the Seven Acres Wood, located right on Austin City Limits. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Ditto what the last guy said. Yeah, I'm, I'm next to Brian. I don't know. I'm, I'm just... I, I, I was so focused on what you said. I almost said, and Bryce Brushwood. <laughs> don't, don't start rumors, back. man. Once you're on the compound, you're all a Brushwood. That's, right, that's, right. that's the first thing that happens is you sign this document that changes your legal name. <laughs> So I want to jump right into it. This was a story that came up last week, and I saw this, and I want to get your take on it. And, and Bryce, um, I didn't even bother sending the link because you're, you're faster than I am at sending emails. Boston Robotics released a commercial for one of their robots to say, hey, you know those scary robots you've been we've been threatening you with? They're now going to be available. You're going to be able to buy one of these. And... Uh, we, they put up a commercial, really well produced commercial showing one of these robots in use. And it's one of the ones we've seen before. And uh, if you want to take a look at this commercial, I want you guys to watch it. Um, if uh, there's a, I think there might be a Verge, maybe had a link directly to the whole thing. And I want to get your take on it. I want to get everybody's take on this because we're now seeing, we're in the future, guys. Robots are for sale. Okay, all right. We this is the spot robot, the one that looks like a like a dog kind of with uh, construction equipment. It, it It's animated, uh, I don't know, it looks like maybe uh, 15, 20 frames per second, so it looks a little bit cartoonish as they it moves. They say it goes three miles an hour, 90-minute battery. Navigates tra challenging terrain. So now, yeah, it is It is currently traversing its way uh, on top of a pile of trash, now walking down steps at a construction site. 360 okay. yeah. cameras to Oh, avoid this obstacles. is interesting that they're, that they're putting it as people are framing a house. So a bunch of they're framing it like construction equipment. So I guess I, I wasn't yeah. far off. So to uh, what? Okay, what use as, is it? It's opening a door, but I don't see it doing. It's opening a door for its fellow robot person. But they're not going anywhere. To to go out into the surface of Mars or some crap where it's carrying. Uh, where it carries carrying one a... cinder block. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Crash protection, dynamic reaction. So that's all the like, you hit it and it stays afloat. Self rights after it falls. I mean, this. Uh, oh my goodness. I, I okay. It says it operates in negative twenty Celsius to to uh, forty five degrees Celsius. Uh, rain apparently, it also exists in Jurassic Park uh, <laughs> as it is now walking through heavy rain. And all in we're a jungle seeing. Jungle setting. Uh, 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 it's okay. in a Wes Anderson movie. And then, yeah. then it goes to a AstroTurf fake set and then walks into a construction guy's house and then lays down, in evoking the, the image of a dog. I, 
Okay. All right. First off, the robotics is incredible. The movement, yes. the motion, yes. amazing. What's your reactions? This is uh... quite possibly the worst ad I've ever seen. If it's meant as an ad, if it's meant to be played in the background during a keynote, then that's fine. But, it, okay, in, in the advertising world, they talk about the difference between features and benefits. This was quite mm -hmm. literally nothing but features and no benefits. The closest they got is they depicted for about four seconds a spot carrying a single cinder block. This may be this, if this is truly intended as an ad, it is the reverse. Think of the iPhone launch where they say, mm -hmm. wouldn't you love to connect with your loved ones? Wouldn't you love to get your email? Wouldn't you love to have a map of everything? Those are all benefits that happen to use the iPhone. I, I hate this beyond words, Andrew. Well, what's annoying? Well, so I'm on, I, I'm on the I, website here for it, and it has some of the applications for it, and all of, and most of it is sensors and and camera work, stuff that is not carrying things, but that doesn't come across in the ad. It's just walking left to right in the ad, and there's not even like a a, a metaphor of it doing these like remotely inspecting facilities or in, you know, creating digital twins of construction sites or, you know, navigating dangerous situations remotely. Well, yeah, I, I think I think right now it is primarily on their website listed as a camera that walks around. Would you like a camera that walks around and shows you things when you're not there? I assume it is all, you know, uh, wired up so you can watch whatever it is on your phone. Uh, the, the the big thing here, though, is that ad to me screams somebody wants to buy these things that have already been viral for years. Right. That that is an announcement that there is a thing for sale. The fact that it does not list a price either outwardly on its website or in the commercial tells me that this is primarily a if you have to ask, you can't afford it kind of luxury. And on top of that, it implies to me that they don't actually want to sell very many of these. Like, if, if w the worst thing you want is a bunch of people buying it, and then you got to make a, a whole bunch of them, especially if you have, let's say, a Generation 2 coming down the pipeline. So in that case, I might forgive this bad of an advertisement, but the fact that something so awful yeah, but, but ends think, with... But think, like... Uh, like, like, Brian, I would think of it, this is more of a visual press release than it is an ad. This is not like the, 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 the Steve Jobs, uh, the, you know, your entire record collection in your pocket. This is a effectively just a visual version of something that would have come through the fax machine uh, in bold type print up, up top. Uh, uh, Boston Dynamics announces that this is for sale. Please contact sales department. I mean... Okay, but even, even the, it's worse than everything. It's the worst Boston Dynamics video we've seen all the way back to and including the very first one, the one that put it on the radar for all of us. Like, if anything, just do a supercut of showing us how far Boston Dynamics has come for 30 seconds and then say, now finally, for sale, spot. That, that I think would you be should just make it like, remember that scene in RoboCop when RoboCop keeps kind of waking up periodically and they're like, one day they're drunk at the Christmas party and they're like kissing them and everything. I feel like that should be the ad. And then it's just spot. I don't know. Email us. That should be their slogan. I, you just know what? Email us if you're rich. That'd be better. That'd be better in my book. Uh, also, <laughs> I assume you listen to the same podcast I listened to, where they mentioned that that kiss scene was totally improv. All, all of the party stuff. No, I have not. I have not. No. It's an what amazing podcast. It's in your feed, and you you will figure out which one it is. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I yeah, I think they build amazing stuff. I think this spot is an amazing piece of robotics and what it's capable of doing. But it is that you know there's. And I don't want to accuse them of this, but there is in the technology world, you sometimes get you get entrepreneurs or people who are trying to solve a problem. And then you get sometimes engineering solutions where engineers have a technology. They're trying to find an application. And, yeah. and we can all imagine that it's not hard for any of us to imagine that 10 years from now, we could see a lot of robotics being used for a lot of things and doing cool stuff. 
but it's just this this first commercial where like the only piece of work we see what doing is literally carrying a cinder block yeah. to I don't know what to like go throw it through the construction manager's window <laughs> because they want to you know a break. I, it just is a little confusing to me, and I think that. I think, like, yeah, I think nobody here, I think, is doubting, you know, there's no future to robotics, um, but it is this sort of weird, like, what could this do that I couldn't do with, like, an RC car, you know? Yeah, just... there's a million things that you could do for, like, the camera stuff. I, I guess I could see, depending on what the what the price tag is on it, like, if you are just a contractor, right, and you are working on stuff, uh, or you're, like, building houses to have a thing that's just kind of walk knowing where you are and is following you with just a bunch of tools or other things that you would need. That's would be annoying to drag like a gigantic toolbox around that I could see, but it doesn't look like that's the market that they're pitching this to, because if they were, they'd list a price. What they are looking for are gigantic companies to call them and be like, yes, we'd like to order a fleet. Like, I feel like they're only taking orders for 20 units and above. And we don't really know, we know that it walks and has a scanning thing, and I'm sure we can dig into the site and find out more, like, does it do a predetermined route? What's going on? You know, what's, 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 what else there? And, you know, one of the things that I had this epiphany with my little robot vacuum cleaner was the idea that, and not, not, again, epiphany other people would realize, and I finally caught on to what the trend was, special purpose robotics are still have a very, are a great idea. You know, build a yeah. thing that just vacuums your floor. Build a thing that just mops the floor. You know, there's build a better thing to maybe clean dishes and you know the all purpose robot will happen maybe one day but small focus on trying to do everything's hard but focus on small tasks and you can do something cool so well and uh again it's it's i'm deeply confused just whether or not they actually intended to sell anything and um if they did they did a very poor job but maybe that's what they wanted to do because they only have so much capacity Here's what I do know. Somebody got paid a lot of money to make that commercial, and they were very confused about exactly what they were doing beyond watching the cool robot go. And so somebody got to, got to do a bunch of really cool storyboards for what it was, but I'm sure that there was a very weird meeting wherein they were like, hey, what are we uh, selling here? Like, what do you want to, who do you want to sell it to? And they were like, ah, just make a thing. Uh, we trust you guys. Go. Yeah. It feels like a group of engineers who become company managers in a room with some, you know, advertising people saying, yeah, we, we, we see these app. We think this, 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 and this, and not a lot of deep market sort of research. I could be totally wrong. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I guess that that's the thing is that also it's an awkward hybrid because normally if it's something that's inside if it's business to business effectively right like you are selling just a fleet to another gigantic construction conglomerate or something like that or as security robots you know to wander around some corporate campus then you don't really need a fancy ad like you just need like it look watch us you're a fairly plain shot of it doing a thing you make an ad like that if you want to sell to the consumer and they don't have anything listed there so it just isn't awkward fit for a company that I think is still trying to find exactly what it exists for besides uh, making everybody scared that there's going to be a robot revolution and we're going to lose. Yeah. Well, you know, one revolution we never have to worry about losing is Bryce's future as a stock photography model. That's right. I mean, moonlight as a, as a, as a shutter stock model. Speaking People of which, I, we, we were talking about this before the show. Could you mm -hmm. just give me the perplexed engineer look? <laughs> there it is. Yeah. yeah that's the one. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, it's just a segment I like to call for the audio listeners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Bryce. I just got a message here. There's a website called generated.photos where they've taken that idea of faces that have never existed before, and they now have a library of 100,000 headshots of totally computer-generated faces. And I guess we're not that far away from typing in perplexed engineer and getting perplexed oh, engineer. Oh, my goodness. Uh, in the advertisement, it says no licenses, uh, I, 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 no, no releases, hassles, no, no releases. Wow. 
That's great. Oh and you can go. So oh, wow, hold is, on. You, you, there's like a there's like a drop down, so you can actually pick their ethnicity, their age, yep. gender, their mood. This is. Oof. Well, I, I, okay. Gender, on the one hand, we're amazed photos. because of the fidelity, but on the other hand, isn't this character creation at the beginning of Fallout? <laughs> like, like isn't yes. this the same thing? Oh no! Thing? But now, but now you get to do it for stock images. Now you get to create these photo realistic. Uh, 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 photorealistic versions. Oh my of god! It. I all uh, I want to do is this see is, this. Wait, is this is this like bankruptcy? Is this basically like like Black? Uh, uh, was it Monday? Black Monday or Black Friday with the stock market collapse? Uh, I think there was one of each. One yeah. of each. Yeah, it's that for pretty people. Like congratulations, <laughs> the bottom just fell out on attractiveness. I just want to see this so, on Monster Factory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, some scary uh, boys. As far as what separates this from, let's say, like uh, like in game design, choosing characters is that those often use there are like thirty different presets or something like that that have a bunch of combinations. This is literally saying, okay, grab a thousand images of people with dark skin, a thousand people with this sort of hairstyle, and generate from there entirely new, you know, never existing before. So. You know, there's going to be infinite because it's it's just it's literally breaking down the process of an image, you know, a face oh, itself. Dear. <laughs> so this is so I don't I don't know if their web tool is actually working right now. They have a link to this Google Drive, and this is the very first image in the very first folder of a it's model not great. giving pause right, face. All right. So so yeah, it's a dude who's squinting, but one eye is squinting a lot more than the other one. It's a, uh, definitely a person mid-stroke right now. Yeah. No. Look under the caption. It says the Rihanna blink. <laughs> yeah, it is. That, that is that is Rihanna trying to wink. Uh, so wait, Bryce, what mood do you think that that first dude is in? What mood would that be? Oh, it's an incredibly big mood. That's uh, for sure. Uh, uh, Bryce, did I hear you correctly? Did it's did you say big. how they drop down? <laughs> did did you say that this is the very first image in the entire catalog? It's it's image zero 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 one dot jpg folder. 10,000, which is the first one, and then that's right, 000001.jpg. Oh, this is garbage. <laughs> These are all garbage. Go to the next one, and because sure. it looks minute. like the hair was be messed our new up. Album art? I know we haven't changed our album art in forever, but I feel like that's our new mascot. <laughs> okay, look so at the right. Look at her hair. It's garbage. There. Yeah, the hair is always a big thing for it. Like, if you use any of the other, like, generate face things, hair and clothes, or when there are multiple people, or even <laughs> just the edges of images are still pretty rough. Also, she's clearly a vampire. Go back. Look at, look at that. She's a, she's a mono vampire. Some of us have snaggle teeth, too. Um, <laughs> uh, snaggle teeth eat solidarity. Yeah, but, 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 but that ends in a, in a, a very sharp point. <laughs> she's not real, Bryce. Stop defending her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, this guy looks okay. That looks like an average dude. Yeah. Let's see. Finally, average is available to the masses. What, what? Oh, yeah. hold it! I love Doctor Whoa. Who. Tom Baker. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is very. If, if you're not listening, go check out youtubecom bbpedia videos where we have the video version of the show. Uh, uh, what, what what is the site, by the way? Is it people in case people want to uh, generated play along? dot photos generated, generated dot, dot, photos. dot photos. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there's not this tool that they're describing doesn't exist yet, Andrew, or is is it not like public? like a public thing. um that is that might be a way to search through stuff so you know basically mm -hmm. they're saying they put like they have they created like a hundred thousand of these images and you know the the point is that this is the starting point this is where it begins and there are do you see you, you you just go through there like in that collection of images right off the bat we saw a little bit that looked a little uncanny we saw some defects but there's some totally usable ones in there and it's a totally free library of images yeah. and where does it go from here you know what is Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4 of this stuff. So let me ask you a question. So we've seen uh, uh, music, for example, that there is an increasing element of, uh, of you know copyright claims on like, oh, this is a melody or a feel that has been part of this music. Is there ever going to be a point where if you can prove that you were that your face was part of the infinite goulash that went into one of these generated images that you could assert uh, uh, some kind of copyright on it. That conversation has come up relating to other sorts of content that 
certain groups or individuals have been I've talked to that have wanted to use that to build, you know, uh, a neural net. And uh, that's going to be a thing that I'm sure we will see a case. We're going to see something at some point as particularly because as people become more cognizant of how our images are being used, like, you know, they just had uh, a contractor working for Google just got into a bit of heat because they're looking for homeless people to do facial scans trying to solve a problem, which is that a lot of data sets that, that people of color are often underrepresented. So some group said, well, you know, got contracted to get more, you know, persons of color and facial scans and were apparently going to homeless people and not fully divulging, you know, when they were looking at the men in black device, what this was for. Yeah. So somebody, will somebody make a lawsuit about this and we'll get some sort of case law to decide it? Probably. So I have a real world case that this, right now as is as flawed as it is would be perfect for uh there was a case i think there was a campaign in new york where somebody it was an anti-rape campaign and so they bought a whole bunch of oh. uh, of stock images and they said eh, you know something like uh, uh hey man uh, not all rapists look creepy uh, the face uh, the face of rape something or other and then meanwhile this is a model who just showed up and did a gig and then and then yeah. their face is being paraded around on taxi cabs all over as the new face of rape. <laughs> like, there's, there's, yeah. there's another story, maybe you guys not to the same degree of severity, but there's another story of a woman who did a similar thing. She went just for a stock model you know, session and got a few hundred bucks. But then the company that owns those photos went and sold those photos. And so this one woman became the face of, I, I want to say it was like a hemorrhoid cream. And it, it was everywhere, and it was this huge marketing thing, and it was her, and she couldn't do anything about it. Well, it's and, and the same you, you know what? If we're going to do kind of that middle ground, um, mm -hmm. there, I, I remember Jeff Kanata had done one of these generic photo shoots of him holding an arrow pointing to a thing, like, oh, look at this over here. And somebody had grabbed it from a stock photo thing, and what he was pointing at was something – uh, pseudoscientific or, or that, that it was, it was that fringe thing. It's just like homeopathic remedies that'll, that'll cure anything. And he's just like, no, I don't agree with this. This is a stock image that they bought or whatever. Uh, seems to me like if you know that what you're selling is on the wrong side of, of science, maybe you would definitely prefer to get these non-real people. I mean, it would seem like if you were on the wrong side of wanting to pay any money, you would want to use all these free people that now are freely available and look literally indistinguishable, except for that lady. Oh, my God. Oh, geez, uh, uh, from actual human beings. Ah, this kid's oh! got a bullet hole in his head. <laughs> or is that a it. tiny little head <laughs> coming out of his head? <laughs> There's a, it, it kind of touched back a story we talked about before was that I think it was some researchers from MIT, they released a story talking about the hipster effect that anti-conformists are way more conforming than they realize. You know, the, the yeah. ones who, you know, that, that if you think that you're anti-conformist, you're actually much more likely to try to conform to something. And they had a photo of an article ran with that with a photo of a hipster. And a guy wrote, said, hey, how dare you use my photo? This is slander, blah, 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 insulting. And then turned out it was a Getty stock image of some totally different other guy. <laughs> oh, hilarious. wow. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, um, let's see if we can find his. Uh... Although, by the way, I've met that dude a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've, I've, I've uh, met. That dude is always a friend of mine's boyfriend. He wrote, your lack of basic journalistic ethics in both the manner in which you report this uncredited nonsense and the slanderous unnecessary use of my picture without permission demands a response and, of course, pursuing legal action. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and that was the, the irony, of course, was the article was about how hipsters don't yeah. realize how important they are. <laughs> and, and follow up article, evidence. I'll tell <laughs> you what, guy. man, we, we enter a world where it's it's worth the extra I'm money. Sorry, we're Brian already Fokker in a world. The, beard, the beards confuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We're already in a world where, uh, despite the ridiculous extra expense, it makes sense to buy stock images because you at least know that they're clean IP and that they all have releases. But even then, you have the troublesome possibility that somebody will dispute the release after the fact based on how you're using it, no matter how many levels of insistence or paperwork on there. At least you have... 100% clean IP with a 100% like all of a sudden 
the logical thing becomes to do nothing but digitally created people, right? Yeah, I think, you know, it's somebody who signs away a release, it, it generally won't get very far if it's used in the context of it. So you're sort of safe to use those. But the cost, I mean, that's the thing is like you look at what it costs to use a Getty image and these things are ridiculously expensive for this stuff. And, and understandable. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of work that goes on behalf of photographers and don't want to downplay that. But, you know, it, it's, we're not that it's over for you, symmetrical faced hose. That's it. <laughs> All hail those with kind of weird droopy eyes. We will remain king. No more for you and your high-priced, uh, attractive-looking faces to sell our dish soap. Now we have the computers do it. They will be our saviors in the same way that you, dear listeners, are our saviors when you head to patreon.com slash weird things. That is where you can support this very program, and indeed you have for oh so many weeks, months, and years. We thank you for making sure that we continue to do this very program. Patreon.com slash weird things. Head on over there right now. So there was a paper published in the FEMS Microbiology Ecology uh, Journal, I assume. Uh, microbiologist Jose Lopez a professor at Nova Southeastern University. Hey! Right next to where uh, Justin grew up and his colleague uh, W. Raquel Piazzotti and Alexander Rosada from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. They've got a very interesting idea on how to deal with the contamination of Mars. Their plan is, because that's a big thing, planetary protection, how do you prevent contamination? They've got a solution. You ready for this? All right. I, and, and, and by the way, we've talked about this before. I know you guys haven't read it, but the, the Mars Trilogy by Kim Stanley Robinson, there's the reds and the greens. The greens say contaminate everything, make it a paradise that's lush with life. The reds say, no, 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 the geology is invaluable. You're going to corrupt all of that. It was, it, it's a clever inversion of the traditional environmentalist debate. So, so what is their take on this? They're like, contaminate away. They said, listen... Once you put people there, that's going to get contaminated. And the idea that we're going to try to protect or prevent this sort of thing from happening is pointless. We might as well go contaminate and spread our microbes everywhere because we should be consider it not accidental but inevitable. The idea it's going to happen no matter what. Either we never go there ever or we do in – I What's the point? I 100% agree with this. I feel like there is a decent chance – that there's well, probably not completely zero, but let's say, let's say for sake of discussion that there is no double helix DNA that is not within, uh, you know, a, 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 a 10,000 miles of Earth, then there should be, and it should be everywhere, and we should get it out there so that some generation, uh, millennia, eons hence, can at least grow and possibly create intelligence again, even if humans wipe themselves out. You get into, you know, and they're at, their suggestion is if we ever want to, you know, change Mars, live on Mars, you know, turn, turn the environment around, then we're going to have to do this. And it is, it gets into a fundamental question. And that's what you, the, the point you brought up that, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson brought up between the Reds and the Greens is that you have some people like, no, it's wrong to do that. And it comes down to like grand scheme of things. What is wrong? Is there, is is it wrong that we want to explore and we want to go live on this other planet and have people living there? From some point of view, that is. The so idea is th that, th th think about this. Here, here's a fun one. Uh, is it wrong to take a mostly developed planetoid and on purpose take another planetoid, even though this first planetoid is, is let's say, two-thirds developed, and take this other one that smashes into it, liquefies everything, and undoes all of the progress so far? Congratulations. I just described how we got a moon. Very likely the instrument that continues to do a gravity sweep and allows life to exist on planet Earth. Well, and we, we've had, from that impact and other impacts, we've had pieces of Earth that have made their way to Mars and vice versa. There's been, there's been the potential for cross-contamination that's been happening for a billion years between the two planets. And I, I, this is, this is uh, I've said this before, I'll say this again, 
we think about the idea that like, oh, if we found life on Mars, it'll be the biggest discovery. It'll be one of the biggest discoveries in science ever. Theoretically, but the thing is, is we will get, it won't be like, we know now for sure there's life on Mars. If we find microbes on Mars, the first step people are going to, we think we had it, but we may have brought it here and it may have contaminated. That'll be the first question we ask. So it won't be like, yeah, there's life on Mars. We won't know for sure. Then if we re you know reduce that, it might be, yeah, but you know what? We think these microbes may have been carried by asteroids from Earth and maybe we contaminated earlier on. So it's still cool, but it's not as cool as it coming from there. You know, there will be all these degrees and anywhere in our solar system that we find microbial life. Those will be the questions we're going to ask, which will sort of like put water on the whole. We found life elsewhere, unless it's really complex multicellular. So, you know, I mean, um, so, um, so I, I don't know that you flatly said whether you're on board with this analysis or not. Are, are you on board with it? Oh, uh, contaminating it, putting microbes like just just defacing this beautiful, pristine, completely dead yeah. world that is doing absolutely nothing. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, I'll tell you what. I don't even call it contaminated. I, I call it getting it in the shower, washing its hair, getting a haircut, and getting a goddamn job and doing something with its life. Oh, shaggy Mars. Uh, shambling around the solar system, not doing anything. Oh. oh, is there water? Well, it better find some water and some soap while it's at it. Filthy oh, man. hippie Mars. I was and here back when this was red rocks as far as the eye can see, and then along came earthy apple seed, and he scattered his life dust all over this place, just like he did all the way out of the solar system and beyond. I'll tell you what. Screw yeah. you, Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> We, we, we're never going to have an agreement to what is the right thing to do because there's going to be different goals towards that. And you, the question you would ask, you know, the people who are staunch planetary protectionists is, at what point would you think colonization is okay? At what point would you say there is no risk of contamination? The answer is you could never say there's no risk of contamination. So you have to say either we never colonize or you have to say after we've done X amount of research with robot probes or something, but if... There's not an incentive to do that research, but there's an incentive to send people there. It, it gets into this, I want it to be this way, the other groups, I want it to be that way. And I don't know if there's ever a compromise there. Do, do you think that there's any value in at least the idea that once we go there or once we contaminate it to whatever degree we consider the word contaminating it, uh, that there's no undoing it? Or like that the pristineness of Mars now we can't replicate again. Yes, that is an argument, <laughs> but I have a hard time. It's that tree falls in I mean, the wood and there's nobody to hear it. It's just like, you know, uh -huh. it's like these trees deserve to fall in peace without anyone hearing them. No, but, but like if we had a way to like, cause we haven't, if we had a way to get at Mars and, you know, get even more data before, you know, Earth intervention, wouldn't that be scientifically? I, I don't know. Uh, what, what, well, that's, maybe, that's, maybe. that's I actually. Think, I think what, what we're what we're what we're at now is a point of we don't know, and you don't want to ruin these mystery boxes before we could fully understand what is in them. But that is always an untenable position, right? Because they don't contain any you know known knowledge. They contain possibly something that we would uh, uh, have an idea of long down the road that maybe we would say, oh, geez, it would have been nice if we would have kept the bleep flop. But ultimately, the, the, our point on Mars is survival. Our point on Mars is colonization. Well, and if we're going to do that, then that's what just needs to happen. And, and there is, I think, I think Bryce is getting at sort of a utilitarian argument where it's like, there mm -hmm. is a precious resource called an untainted planet. And as far as we know, we don't have very many of them. And do we want to go from some number of them to one less immediately? And, and I, th I think that all of us here would probably agree that, first of all, it's a fantasy. The moment we drop Voyager on there, despite our best efforts to sterilize everything, or sorry, not Voyager, uh, 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 Viking, Viking. Um, then it was already over, but also I would give the counter utilitarian argument of saying, uh, w yes, there's some amount of detriment to the complete loss. We will never have a pristine Mars again, but the benefit of 
to Earths is so great that it merits the moral justification to intentionally corrupt the the pristine Mars. Even if that's just you know the the second to next thing that we do. I mean, I I and I, I don't know what the first thing we would do with the pristine Mars, but uh, ideally there would be some sort of evidence. You know, continued and and deeper evidence gathering of well, what so, it looks like before uh, the, we be begin and like yeah let's do it when it's time to do it but th this is played out in the red red mars green mars blue mars tri trilogy where what happens is 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 the side that you're representing right now that that is the geologist side and they're super annoyed that it's like so much data we could have had and now we can't do it and what happens is is as humans take over more areas uh, geologists are like, well, it's not perfect, but they go higher and higher. Keep in mind, Olympus Mons is so high up that it creates a double horizon. If you go far enough, you see the actual horizon of the curvature of the planet. Then you see uh, the caldera of a volcano pop above it. So the idea is like at that point, even though uh, down below however many feet there's some kind of breathable atmosphere, uh, above it, it still might as well be completely untouched, in space, sterilized, uh, original stuff. So the important thing is to remember it won't all happen at once. It'll be an mm -hmm. infection that spreads, and we can study w ahead of that wave of infection uh, as, as we go forward. I think that, you know, we... We certainly have, you know, there's the argument like, ah, oh, we don't want to bring our problems there. And I'm like, well, sure, obviously, but we're better at a lot of things now than we were before. And, you know, you take like in the United States, we have, uh, if you look at a map of the part, a number of, not of the United States that is national parks and forests and stuff, it's incredible. You know, we have an incredibly large part of our country that we have said, don't develop. Every now and then we do land swaps, things like that. But generally, those things have increased, not decreased. And we've actually taken back lands. We've actually probably reached peak farmland, and we've been taking back and reclaiming lands. And, you know, in their arguments could be like, it's coming to the expense of other countries, perhaps, but also increases in agriculture. You know, there, there are more trees today in the U.S. than there were before. And it's not solely because we're just importing them, whatever. You put a value on that. As you become a wealthier economy, you put a value in that kind of preservation. And I would think that you know, we go to Mars, we're going to not decide that everything's going to be in Applebee's there. You know, we're going to have large parts of it there. But the, but micro, micro, microbial contamination, microbes don't know where they can or cannot go. And I do think that, like, yeah, I understand the sense of loss of, let's say we found a big ecosystem underground there that had bacteria and our bacteria get along and do something to it. There's that risk. But, you know, I, I look at it a choice between the exciting opportunity of, if we can inhabit another planet and we can have, and, and not even Earth too, just a different world in our solar system filled with humans doing their own kind of thing in their own culture and their own thing. I and mean, that just sounds exciting to me. Yeah. And and so, I'm uh, I'm not saying let's not do it. Like, just to be clear, I'm not saying let's never do it. I'm just saying there's probably a phase we can do with this thing that we have first and then. Well, no, that's the I'm saying lead with the Arby's. <laughs> lead with the Arby's, and we're going to terraform the planet with wicked beef gassers. That's Meet, how we're going to do it. Meat Mountain. We're cutting, we're well, cutting Bryce, sweet your, your point, beef your gassers. Earth, your Earth first and last point. Um, the question is, is that how do we say there's a moratorium that for the next 20 years we only do robotic exploration and we, and we do this? It, and, and well, that is, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know what we would do with it at all, but we've never made it out there yet with a human. Well, and either, also, so. But also it's like, all right, look, so let's say we did. Let's say we put on a 20-year moratorium. Who's going to be out there playing Coast Guard when China shoots off a rocket looking to colonize? Who's going to be the Coast Guard when Russia does it? Who's going to be the Coast Guard when, when uh, you know, a, a, a Zuckerberg and his boys get drunk and charter a SpaceX rocket because they want to go skinny dipping on Mars? Like this is this is just as soon as we have the ability to get there, if we have the ability to guard it, we have the ability to get there. And that's just going to be a wrap. Like oh, as soon man. as that Space bridge is built, too. everybody will be there. Mm -hmm. And there are, there's going to be very unless we get ironclad understand okay. understanding, then, yeah, it's going to be very hard. So, OK, try this on for size. The moon. We know for sure. Let's say for sake of discussion, we know for a fact there's not a single living thing on the moon. Let's say there's a lava tube with the most complex, gorgeous, crystal lattice formation, snowflakes times a billion, that took, uh, let's say, let's say uh, 13.5 million years to form. 
all of it made out of, for sake of discussion, something valuable, helium-3 or whatever. That, that doesn't make sense because it's uh, probably not We're solid. going, but it's fine. But, uh, but uh, we get photos of it, and then we start harvesting it. Do you have a campaign to stop the harvesting of the most valuable thing in the world because it happens to be arranged in a very visually attractive pattern that took a very long time to make. Well, we've, we've had sort of examples of that, like these crystal caves in Thailand and places like that, where they find these the largest quartz crystals we've ever seen, these formations that are like incredible. And they won't even tell people where they are. Like the tallest tree in the United States is a secret because we want to protect it. As from is being the oldest down. tree. Yeah. And it's like, and my question is, what makes the tallest tree in America that much better than the 50th tallest tree, you know, or the, the 40th oldest tree, you know? And it's like, why is that worthy of protection? And they're not. It's bigger. Fend for itself. Man, it's, really... it's, it's, it's hard because <laughs> emotionally I get it, but, but logically I, I can't even get close to justifying it. It's like uh, uh, that, that stuff can save lives and power cities and enable people to go see spelling bees of their grandchildren. And, Cutting down well, the trees? I or mean, the well, let me, let, me, let me throw a, a, oh, an crystals. opposite to Justin's suggestion about, you know, the, hey, you know, who's gonna, if you have the ability, who's going to stop you? Yeah, I'm more concerned about, let's say, SpaceX says, hey, we have the capability. We can do a human mission in 2026. All the other countries that are nowhere near close to being able to get to Mars or even, you know, parts of an agency here that are opposed to this start screaming planetary protection as a way to stop them. Not so much because they're worried about planetary protection, but they just don't want the don't want that to be first. I, I, I don't doubt that all, all of these are coming. These are all issues that we are going to face the more that this stops becoming a science experiment and starts becoming industry. Like once you start, you know, there's, there's that old saying that like uh, uh, he who controls time controls the world. And that was like about like our modern time system being set by the British, right? Uh, uh, who knows? I mean, if you control the rockets, you control space. You control all of that industry. You control the lifeline between planets. Like, as this moves away from an engineering problem and into who's going to control the railroads, not whether or not we can build them at that scale, uh, man, we, we are going to see titanic conflicts, the likes of which we have only dreamt about. Yeah, I, I think that we're going to see some people that if it was their group that was going to be doing the exploration, they would assure us that they have the proper planetary production protocols in place. But if it's another group that's doing it, they will use as an excuse to say, oh, no, you can't do this. You and don't it, have the proper licensing, sir. And you in know so many we ways, do... we, we have already seen this. And, and uh, I, I, it's really weird to to sort of gird our loins and get ready for the next version of the invasion of the new world uh, or, or the next westward expansion and the next uh, uh, railroad barons, the next everything. That's that's crazy. I think I got the the solution is that we like get a bunch of dirty underwear from Dragon Con and we put it on a rocket <laughs> and we just preemptively contaminate Mars. I'm like, it's too late. It's been done. Yeah. Sorry, we tossed the laundry bomb. It's like the Genesis probe from, you know, Star Trek. You know? Yeah. Just a, we are, we've colonized Mars one skid mark at a time. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Let's go to picks. <laughs> hey, man, I had a pick, but then I started reading another book. Can I do two picks? No. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think can. so. You know. uh, well, one pick is uh, I mentioned before the works of uh, Ryan Holiday, uh, who wrote uh, Ego is the Enemy, The Obstacle is the Way. He wrote Trust Me, I'm Lying, and uh, I'm about halfway through his uh, stillness is the key, which is um, if, if there's sort of a trend, it's like he talks about kind of a, a primer on uh, stoicism with the obstacle is the way he talks about, you know, getting out of your head and the importance of it to uh, getting ahead in life because you're not, you know, ego is the enemy and stillness is the key is the more focused on the, the practical tools to get to that state of bliss so that you can achieve peak performance and stuff. I, uh, uh, I, 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 I've enjoyed it, but I stumbled across uh, another book, and I don't know when it came out, but uh, but it's by a, 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 a Peter uh, Bogosian and James Lindsay called uh, "How to Have Impossible Conversations: 
and it's fantastic. I'm only like a couple hours into it, but I'm blown away. They are practical guidelines and rules in this increasingly fractious environment where we could barely have a conversation at Thanksgiving about how to have conversations with people who believe fundamentally different things from uh, what you believe, who probably will view your motives with hostility and ways that you can make sure to have a productive conversation. Things that some of us do intuitively, uh, and, and other people, it'll, it, it'll be kind of a light bulb moment. Many of us try to deliver a message where it's our job to tell you, no, the environment's dying, you need to stop it or whatever. And then, and then they're like, they're, when they're asking questions, it's like, why deliver the message? Why are you not hearing it? Uh, likewise, he talks about the importance of treating whoever it is you're talking about as a partner. And so as you do with many partnerships, you sort of ask, where are we headed with this? Uh, what, what are we hoping to get out of this? And he mentions like, there are visible signs that you could tell when somebody's shutting down. You, there are visible signs. There are things people say that mean, I don't feel like you're hearing me. And there are things you could do to correct that. It is a delightful guide to communication. I'm probably going to read it multiple times. Uh, so far, it's really, really great. Man, that sounds great because I walk away so many times, mainly from this podcast going like, why was I trying to force this on everybody? Why was I trying to push this out there? And, <laughs> and I just, I'm like, what? I'm still that guy, you know, trying to prove something I don't need to. So well, I need and, to read this. And in fact, I, I'm just as guilty as, as I think both of us uh, would, would agree with each other. Uh, like, uh, there are times that I'm like, no, 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 you're not listening. You're not listening. And of course, uh, what this book does is give you the tools to notice when you fall. It identifies the pitfalls and the traps and gives you the tools to notice when you're falling into them and, and ways to set boundaries at the beginning so that both of you could guide to a delightful conversation, including knowing when to tap out. He, he kind of says, these are the type of things people say that really indicates that you're not going to get anywhere productive after this point. I highly recommend using these off ramps, these exits. It's I, I'm really digging it. No, I'll there, check that out. There's, there's definitely, that was part of my, my journalism training, the reporter training that I think ultimately has affected me the most in my real life is understanding that like when you have a limited amount of time to talk to a stranger, specifically a stranger that oftentimes are under duress, you need to completely remove yourself and your ego from a conversation. And, and you need to read social cues really well because your job depends on being able to connect with somebody and find out if there is a negotiable point in which there is information that they would like to get out there into the general public like that it's high stakes version of you can't leave uh, no no good reporter leaves a conversation with a oh screw you screw you unless it's like a, a power play kind of thing you're uh, that, that you're trying to get past a, a barrier of uh, authority but uh, that's fascinating. I got to read it. Uh, I'm only yeah, in the no, first part. He divides it into sort of beginner, intermediate, and expert level stuff. And he says a lot of you, and I'm sure he says this for book readers who can kind of skip over. He says a lot of you are going to want to skip forward to intermediate, perceiving that all the beginner stuff is, is too basic for you. Strongly encouraged. Like there's going to be something in there that you're going to discover that, that you missed from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, so in like journalism school, do they teach you that like do that, but then just run right to Twitter to like, you know, get angry <laughs> yes. at everybody? Please, please make sure that you only uh, uh, put it on a website that you have no control over and don't get paid for uh, in, in advance of your uh, crumbling, terrible paywall that your awful uh, uh, centuries old media company is uh, putting up. Which, by the way, the New York Times advertising themselves as independent journalism. Support independent journalism. Independent of what? You're the paper of record. All right, whatever. Independent Sorry. of profit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, I got a newsworthy little pick for you. Uh -oh. So uh, there have been a lot of, in the last 72 hours, even stories about China. And capping hmm. it off, uh, there is... Big story about the NBA in China. Big story about Blizzard in China. And that we can we can have another conversation where we go into those. But, I mean, I don't know if I have in my life witnessed the kind of run comedically that South Park has had. Goddamn right, I mean, man. I saw this story. We are, 
We are decades, decades into it. And the episode that they ran last week called Banned in China, B-A-N-D in China, uh, is fearless, hilarious, points out the hypocrisies that exist like in so many different facets. Uh, it, it is it is an institution that I don't know if it can ever get the amount of credit that it deserves. Hell, in this episode, which, by the way, is right now on the Comedy Central website, and at least today, when I watched it, had no ads. I, I suspect because companies might not be interested in advertising on something that is now uh, literally banned in China. But uh, uh, it is just remarkable, uh, uh, very funny, and I think very, very prescient considering where we are in our modern culture. I'm, I, yeah, I can't wait to watch that. And, uh, you know, you guys don't have to know how happy I am this conversation is finally out there from my rants and Justin, my texts and stuff to you about, like, why isn't this a topic like five years ago, you know, and now I'm so glad this is now a discussion. And so, I uh, guess it's just kind of, I important. mean, look, I knew the moment I knew that stuff was for real, for real on the, like when China pulls your card, it's serious is when a friend of ours had to have his sad face on the uh, uh, New York times op-ed page because, because he recognized um, that a certain country existed. <laughs> Because he, because he made mention, dare made mention that a company that he worked for, you know, had a connection, and it's like, man, that when that was quick and proactive, like it was, uh, you know, when when, and now we're just seeing it more. We're just seeing that on on a larger level uh, in all these other stories. But again, in terms of satire, uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, I I don't know if anything will be recreated at the um, longevity and scale that South Park has. Uh, there's a joke in that in that episode uh, uh, where the, you know a movie producer or a record producer is trying to talk to the boys about how they're going to make a biopic for their band, and uh, they they make some suggestion, and the record executive says, "Oh, come on, what are you boys from the '90s?" And there's just an uncomfortable look between all of them, just signifying that, yes, I mean, these guys have been doing this since, what, 97, 98? Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I, I think it was 95, uh, no, 96. 97. If, okay. The, maybe the Spirit of Christmas. Uh, yeah, Spirit, Spirit of Christmas, Christmas, I guess, is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy that they, I mean, I'm assuming that they're still doing their, you know, six-day turnaround on this show. It's, yeah, it's it's crazy. Are they still doing the like season long stories? Because that's when I did yeah, I, I, years ago. Yeah, I have not seen anything else from this season, but uh, the episode revolves heavily around uh, what I assume is a season long arc of Randy becoming a pot farmer. Uh, uh, I got to pick. I've been uh, rewatching this. I'm almost done uh, rewatching this, but uh, because because Righteous Gemstones has been really good and Secession has been really good, I've just been in the HBO library again and almost finished rewatching Veep, which is a, a pinnacle of comedy, legitimately one of the best comedies maybe ever. And uh, it, it, it's I, I don't know it's 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 dense but it doesn't feel too fast it doesn't feel too heavy uh the it, it, it has confidence like that's that's the really good thing about it is that it has confidence in all of its jokes so that there's never like uh this big like stop like we just did a big joke we need to stop and let everyone la like it just keeps going 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 and even you know, e even with uh, Iannucci, the the creator and the original showrunner, kind of leaving a few years ago, or you know, a after for for the last what two or three seasons, uh, two it, seasons I believe, yeah. It 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 feels invisible when you when you binge it all. Um, there, there's I guess goofiness, right? It kind of starts off feeling a little more realistic than where it ends up, um, but I think the fact that the show was running from what 2012 up until last last year uh <laughs> politically kind of makes it have to exaggerate a little bit more but uh also veep has uh a lot of good uh china bits uh, 
Oh, I mean the last the last season mm-hmm. like leans heavily and and it gets dark like Veep just uh, an absolute masterpiece. Like like that that is when in a sea of really terrible political comedy and oh my god have we had terrible political comedy over the past uh, uh I mean Geez, uh, I would say we're we're into a decade of political comedy not being good through Obama and not being in any we go, shockingly getting worse, going from toothless to awful in in the Trump administration. The lone bright spot, uh, just proving that everybody indeed is bad and it is not impossible, is Veep. Mm-hmm. I think uh, that show is really well done, but I, there was a change in the writing in the way they featured their antagonists after the last election, though. Yeah, hmm. there, there was a there was a shift in that. You notice, like in Parks and Rec too, which another show I love. But you sort of like, oh wow, there's this. They would have done it differently now because where they're going. But both amazing shows. Yeah. All right, my pick, and I'm gonna I, I want to avoid any kind of controversial thing here, and I'll just kind of go right down the marrow. I, I, the middle. I'm gonna recommend a comic book movie that's out. Um, it's called The Joker. I don't know if you guys saw this because you know DC movies just you know maybe don't get as much attention as Marvel, but uh, I think that I want to champion this movie so it gets some attention because frankly <laughs> I, I hope people see it. Uh, you know, it's a it's a smaller film as far as you know. My goodness, Com- like, like just looking at the poster and remembering that just the cinematography, it's so, uh, it's, it's so well executed. Um, hmm. I, yeah, I love this movie. I really, really enjoyed it. And I know there's a lot of conversations about the movie and, and everybody, you're all right. Everybody's also, right. Everybody- I'm enjoying the conversations about the movie too. It's like, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, I I was, and I, you know, I'm a Scorsese fan, and the films that were influenced it, you know, I, I saw King of Comedy years ago and loved that, loved the stuff like that, and Taxi Driver, all of these things are great, and they're neat, and they have their thing, and and this is a film that, that, that we would be having, the controversy in 2019 would be over a movie about a DC villain, and part of it is whatever sort of... Uh, I don't know what philosophical problems people may have or whatever with it. Fine. But also like, ah, does it borrow too much from Scorsese or this or that? Yeah. What a great conversation to have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think we're, we're in a very interesting age in film criticism and I have not seen the movie. So this is just kind of a meta observation that we almost don't want to have the deep, conversation piece movies anymore and and maybe it's social media that like the movie gets screened for critics two weeks ahead of when we see it but yet all the critics are going to twitter and now it becomes a mini story about what the critics are saying and now there's you know we we now battle on like oh okay well like is there a divide between the public and the critics and yada 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 but it's like i i kind of feel like throughout most of my childhood and where i loved movies hell why I love the internet because the internet was the place where I could have or watch the conversations about movies that were worth having conversations over. And and now that's like a, a controversial or a weird thing that people are like, Oh, I hated this movie. I love this movie. It's like, no, the best ones to talk about were always the most controversial. I, I like that there was this, the criticism was like, oh, these comic book movies with their superpowers and their special effects and stuff. I like good character driven dramas. Guess what? Now we have a really excellent character driven you know drama that's set in the superhero universe. And some people still aren't happy. And and I think, you know, I, I think fans liked it. I liked it. I think the reaction to this has been great. And it shows you that there is an appetite out there for many different kinds of storytelling. So. Yeah, although it does also end in a fight in a junkyard where there's a gigantic light in the sky. So so please prepare yourself for that. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so uh, highly recommend it. And uh, I look forward to you seeing it, Justin. So Brian and I can talk to you. about Yeah. It. Oh, my God. No, I can't wait. Uh, uh, I can't wait to see it. Uh, just been bouncing all over the place here in Florida. So I haven't gotten a chance. Yeah. So and after things, you want to give us your review of uh, uh, Galaxy's Edge? Oh, oh, I got I got takes, my man. I got All right, takes. cool. Well, in that case, it's been weird. 
Oh, man, I did not think we had time for after things. We normally go live in nine minutes for Night Attack. Oh, never mind. You didn't say when we do after things. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, all right, here's my takes. Uh, Star Wars uh, Galaxy's Edge is not as good as either Harry Potter worlds. It's nowhere near as good as Avatar, and it's not as good as probably all but the bootleg uh, uh we couldn't actually get a license for this action adventure mythology park and islands of adventure i would put the the cartoon world better in terms of being immersive for its uh, uh, uh land uh, dr seuss world was more immersive for what its uh, uh what its source material was it's uh, a, a a kind of almost sickening uh reaction to harry potter world which is weird because disney announced Avatar as the answer to the Harry Potter world. They had more time with Star Wars. Uh, Smuggler's Run is disappointing, and I really hope Age of or Rise of the Resistance is a knockout, amazing ride. Because if it isn't, then that is like a sea, a sea park to me. TK421, where are you? We have blasters fired. Blasters fired. Repeat. <laughs> we need reinforcements. Are you kidding me? I, I mean, look, it's it's. It's small. It's, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the immersion just isn't what it could be. When I remember going to Jurassic Park when Islands of Adventure first opened and it felt more like Jurassic Park. It, it brought you more into that world. I don't like Avatar, but Pandora is amazing. There's no way you can walk through Pandora and not feel like, wow, this is an achievement. I feel immersed. And that ride there is the GOAT. Right now, it is the championship belt holder of theme park rides. Uh, uh, so I don't know. And I don't even like the Harry Potter ride in um, uh, the new one, the, the Diagon Alley one. But Diagon Alley is as immersive as any uh, uh, park that you will see. And it's sad that the king of all IP, Star Wars, uh, does not get something at least as good as Hogwarts, if not Diagon Alley. It Full. deserves it. It deserves Pandora. Full disclaimer to anybody hearing this and going nuts. Justin and I had like a 20 minute conversation on the phone earlier and we compared notes on our experiences. And it sounds like Justin got a bunch of uh, uh, things to factor in. Justin legitimately didn't know what I was talking about when I asked him if all of his hosts stayed, stayed in character. And he's like, yeah, of course they did. They're a video. And I was like, no, 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 no. I mean, the human beings. He's like, what are you talking about? And I described my experience where, where they kept in character like it was a renaissance fair. Uh, that was apparently totally alien to Justin, as was his description of the Smuggler's Run ride. Uh, one of the things I loved is that they took six people, they handed them all a thing, and they say, you guys take a moment to negotiate who's going to have which job. And I thought, this is brilliant. They intentionally bake in 10 to 15 minutes in the Millennium Falcon, where we all make sure that as a group, everybody's happy with their job. Justin did not get that experience. He was just shuffled in and told, you're an engineer, go. Uh, so, so your mileage may vary, and I don't know how much of that... Uh, how I mean, much of that was even then, that, that staff that's I'm not even talking about staff like I'm talking about just walking in and looking at the world and seeing how it uh, how it how it makes you feel like the, the, the fact that it's even that small it's apparently the same footprint in Orlando as it is in LA despite the fact that Orlando doesn't have the same space restrictions that LA that does. part really did surprise me because I was looking forward my impression of the LA one was well at least the Florida one will be better and then or, or have more room or whatever but to hear was the exact same thing I mean look I'll just say this is that everybody who's gone there the picture that they take is in front of the Millennium Falcon. It looks awesome. You can see mine. I put it on Twitter. It also looks awesome. Uh, uh, and that's the best ride in the park. It is the world's most expensive Instagram pop-up. Congratulations. You'll be able to get all your cool Star Wars pictures. It'll look great. Oh, by the way, remember to make a reservation for the cantina that you were supposed to do two weeks ago <laughs> before you went to the park. Because that's a great thing if you came from across the country and you were not hip to the fact that you needed to make a, 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 an appointment for a walking in and buying an, a, a super expensive drink. I, I, when I first heard this was being announced, I was super excited. I, I want to go. I live in LA, have not been. I'm like, Andrew, why haven't you been? And I'm like, and I had friends that worked on it all that because the more I found out about it, the more my interest dropped because I'm like, what is it? Well, it's the, there's one ride, a motion simulator, 
there are two extra pay attractions where you can pay $200 to build a lightsaber and walk around and have little kids look at you with envy and feel like the biggest jerk in the world. Or you could build a droid for a hundred bucks, or you could go eat some, you know, some street style tacos with special alien sauce in this environment. I'm like this and a bunch of gift shops. I'm like, there is, I'm like, there's one attraction and some motion simulator. And I, I, I know about the plans and some, the future plans for the park and where it's going, but what it is now, I'm like, why would I go? Why would it's, I go? I, I just I hate very motion much simulators. Not ready. It's not. It's in beta, and and they're 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 saying that it's not in beta. It's still in beta. They got a long way to go. Uh, I I can't imagine what the experience is like. And keep it, not only with like the LARPing hotel and all that stuff. Um, uh, I, I I don't know. Maybe there's something there. Uh, Justin Jedi I mean, Jedi seventy one in the chat uh, is asking. You know, if you needed a reservation for I guess the cantina. Was the uh, was the park crowded? Was it uh, was it was because we've been hearing a lot no. about attendance numbers. So yeah, uh, uh, we walked in. We got there right when Hollywood Studios opened, and we went right to Smuggler's Run. And our wait was listed at an hour and a half. It was actually an hour. Uh, the bigger thing with the cantina is that they only have a limited amount of space, and uh, they they don't want it to get overcrowded. So you have to wait to get in. But apparently, if the line gets past a certain level, they don't let walk-ins in anymore. And now you're just explained to by a spaceman in a space tunic that you are supposed to use your space internet to uh, reserve a spot in the cantina where you're going to get charged $30 a drink to listen to a robot DJ. This sounds like a nightmare to me. This, to me, is like... I, I think... Disney does some things amazing, and and you know when I heard they're gonna try to outdo Harry Potter, which I think I think Harry Potter now is fantastic. Like when you go to the different experiences, what it's become, the different rides, I love it, love it. And then everything about this, everybody I've known has come there, and what I've heard from behind the scenes and stuff when they finally open, I'm like, wow, this is exactly <laughs> this is well because you want to you want to know what look Diagon Alley is supposed to be a place where you buy stuff, right? It's where people buy stuff in the books. It's where people buy stuff in the movies. It's where you have a bunch of uh, big magic-y stuff. And guess what? They do have a bunch of gift shops. Guess what they also have? Other storefronts that have other things going on. You walk by, you see them doing the little magic-y thing. Uh, uh, and maybe you go in there and it's available for you to walk around and see what's happening. Maybe you can buy something. Maybe you can't. But not everything is a excuse to sell you an expensive tchotchke. Well, in Diagon Alley, you can go to all of and you don't have to buy the wand. You know, a kid yeah. can go in there, the family can go in there, they can do the thing. Then afterwards, to buy the wand, it's like forty bucks and it does something. And that's that's you know that's for most families that's affordable and you can do that. To go to Star Wars, and I know they they figure well, our fans are all twenty something year olds with jobs. There's a lot of kids, but the idea of saying, hey, these really cool experiences are not going to be really economically viable for most people, that's mean to me. That just feels mean to me. You know, you know, out of the kids, I can afford to do that, but then I'd feel like a jerk. I don't want to do it. You know, well, I don't want to yeah. walk around growing up with a lightsaber, looking at kids like, ha ha, you know. I, I just I just think it's it's um it was disappointing. And it was disappointing from the point of view of somebody that watched Islands of Adventure open, that watched, that loved Pandora. Uh, I just thought that we were at a certain level of immersion, and I, I just don't think that Star Wars Galaxy's Edge measured up to it. And I, I think that Smuggler's Run, although a very interesting idea, I, I think that the fact that Brian and I had very divergent experiences based on, you know, maybe surliness of, of the cast members that I experienced versus the absolute pinnacle uh, uh, that Brian experienced. I think that to me shows a weakness of the product and not how, necessarily something that that's like that's fair enough. Yeah, like your your storytelling your should be so on rails that a minimum wage employee should be able to give you an extraordinary experiment. Experience. How many people were in your party, Brian? What's that? How many people were in your party when you did uh, the It was uh, me and my 11-year-old daughter, and we took the single rider line, and then we just agreed to meet up afterwards. So how many people – you were with strangers in there? Uh, yeah, all strangers. Yeah. Our, yeah, and that's a big thing. That's the big part of the dynamic is 
who you're in that ride with, you know, if it's like an escape room, if you go to escape room with people who don't like escape rooms or don't pay attention, well, you're going to that, have a miserable... that's why I thought, uh, like I described to Justin, uh, Smuggler's Run would probably be at its best uh, if you had six committed people who mm-hmm. all agreed they're going to play pretend for 15 minutes that they're flying the Falcon. There's plenty to do and you could do the whole thing. I mean, yeah. I, I have very nerdy theme parky kind of critiques on that ride in that it does the same thing that every motion ride does. Uh, from from Back to the Future on, uh, uh, it is something that like and, and compare it to Harry Potter. Harry Potter is loaded with celebrity cameos. Both the Harry Potter rides. It's got the Harry Potter kids in it. It's got Voldemort. It's got Bellatrix Lestrange. It's got the actors doing the thing. You have a great opportunity, even if it wasn't Harrison Ford, even if it was the kid from Solo. Even if it was Lando Calrissian, where at some point the, the, the power turns back on and some old, you know, captain's log or something starts playing. There's these these moments of magic that you just never get because the entire time you have to have this character you just met barking in your ear, explaining, trying to walk people through playing this like barely not on rails video game. And, and that's, I, I think, just sort of disappointing. Like it doesn't achieve what uh it certainly doesn't achieve the immersion that uh, flight of passage does for pandora it doesn't uh, uh, give you the i'm in the movie experience that the harry potter rides are even though they are very flawed uh, and it certainly doesn't give you uh, uh the, the same kind of thrill that when back to the future first came out you were like oh my god this is great like i'm going through all these different uh, uh things like it just was everything was there the soul wasn't and and that's that's kind of my 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 my, my big takeaway. There you have it. All right. Speak of truth to power, Justin Robert Young style. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, 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 you, you want a surefire way to get uh, uh, angry uh, tweets from Jenny Josephson and Garrett Weinzerl? Uh, start saying that kind of stuff on Twitter, because boy, will they get up your butt about it. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Uh, Papa's Market. What did I think of the ET ride? The ET ride was one of my favorites as a kid. I think that was awesome for for what it was initially. Down to the fact that you get to go to the ET <laughs> world at the end, and then it's just like super psychedelic, and you try to make sure that you you know uh, uh, give them a screwed up name so ET pronounces it weird at the end. <laughs> but is it really still fun? Is it really? Oh my gosh! <laughs> <Cool> ride. <laughs> Says Andrews, he pulls up his ET stuffed animal that we got at the ET ride because ET ride rocks. It is amazing. Um, and I'll fight anybody who says otherwise. <laughs> no, the ET, I mean, like that moment where the headlights are mm-hmm. coming up on you and you lift up, like that's an all timer. That's a that's a theme park hall of fame moment. And and yeah. God, I wish I wish that Smuggler's Run had something. Uh, uh, just uh, slightly as as uh, uh, emotional as that moment. Yeah. Well, was this an actual After Things episode? It was. Yeah, I guess so. Sorry. How was it? How was it? <laughs> Tell them how it was. It was after. Nailed it. Hey, there we go. All right. Oh, you're recording, Bryce. I'm like, wow, it's a really good hot take. Is this a... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, uh, uh, we are going to go dark for about five to ten minutes while we get ready for Night Attack here. Yeah. On the Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us for this Tuesday edition of Weird Things and After Things. Uh, keep an eye out. We will be back, uh, like I said, in about five to ten minutes. The stream will turn back on. Your phone might not go off, though. So XOXO. Keep Love an you eye guys. Out. Bye. So, 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 see you.